My name is Brett Harwood. I am a night graduate 1971 Franklin and Marshall College. I'm proud to serve on the Board of Trustees and I'm especially proud and happy to be here today for a couple of reasons. One is I get to introduce Beth Throne, who all of you should know, and if you don't, you have to know her, but uh, who's gonna introduce Barry Schwartz, and let me tell you why I'm here today. Several months ago, in the spring, um, Professor Schwartz lectured a group called One Day University in New York, which I attend from time to time, and as a lifelong learner, I've never stopped um, being curious, learning, um, as I hope all of you will during the course of your life. And, and his, his speaking was so engaging, so insightful, and um, ca candidly, it was, was provided some brilliantly applicable insights to me and my wife who was with me that I took it upon myself to walk up to him after the lecture, introduce myself, and without any authority at all, invite him to come to FNM and speak to, speak to a small group of people, which I thought would be the Harwood scholars in the sophomore year. Well, this is obviously a full day for Barry because he's been programmed to speak to a number of groups, among them the Harwood scholars, um, last but not least. Um, I, I will tell you, um, sitting on the train with him coming down, he joined me in Philadelphia, I came down from New Jersey, um, I, I will tell you, he's a genuinely engaging human being. He has the ability to communicate um, in, a very, in a very complex world some very simple things that all of you, I think, will benefit from. I know I benefited, benefited from his lecture, um, and I will tell you that uh, one, of, one of the goals that certainly I have for the future of FNM is to provide everybody here with those life skills that you may not appreciate now, but 30 years from now, you would say, boy, I really came out with something special from FNM. So with all that being said, I want to I wanna introduce Beth, who you know who's going to tell you about Barry's background, and I think we're all going to enjoy what he has to say today. Thank you very much. And by the way, happy birthday, Brett Harwood. Um, yes. I said, what a wonderful way to spend your birthday. And so when Brett, um, he, he contacted me, he said, you have to bring Dr. Barry Schwartz to campus. I said to myself, where do I know that name? I'm like, he wrote The Paradox of Choice. And so I reached out to colleagues in philosophy and colleagues in psychology where his work is intersects. And they, I was informed about the practical wisdom work. And the more we spoke, the more I realized, yes, we will find a way to bring him to campus to speak to the Harwood participants and alumni. But also, let's try to get him for Common Hour. And I am thrilled that Dr. Schwartz has agreed to be here. Um, he is the Dorwin Cartwright Professor of Social Theory and Social Action at the Department of Psychology at Swarthmore. He has been at Swarthmore since receiving his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He has written 10 books, more than 100 articles for professional journals. In 2004, Dr. Schwartz published The Paradox of Choice, Why More is Less, which is a phenomenal work, especially for millennials. I think you'll find it particularly relevant. In 2004, he was also, this particular book um, was named one of the top business books of the year by both Business Week and Forbes magazine and has been translated into 25 languages. Dr. Schwartz has published articles and sources as diverse as the New York Times, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Parade Magazine, USA Today, Slate, Scientific American, The New Republic, Newsday, Harvard Business Review, and The Guardian. He has appeared on dozens of radio shows, including NPR's Morning Edition and The Talk of the Nation, and has been interviewed on Anderson Cooper 360, The Lair News Hour, The Colbert Report, and CBS Sunday Morning. He has lectured the British and Dutch governments as well as trade organizations and businesses representing industries as diverse as healthcare, finance, travel and leisure, restaurants, consumer electronics, software development, arts, entertainment, home building, and the military. 
broad scope. Um, Dr. Schwartz's most recent book, which I highly encourage you to read if you have not already, is Practical Wisdom, The Right Way to Do the Right Thing, on which he will be speaking today, and on which he has also given an exceptional TED Talk. His new book, a TED book called Why We Work, we'll have to talk about, maybe talking about that one next, um, is due out in 2015. And with no further ado, I am so proud to bring to the podium Dr. Barry Schwartz. It's really a pleasure to be here in the book on choice, which I'm not going to talk to you about. One of the lessons that I draw is the secret to satisfaction is to have low expectations. <laughs> and I'm afraid that my introducers have completely screwed that up. I just can't imagine what I can possibly do that will live up to what you now think I'm about to do. So shame on you. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about practical wisdom. Um, uh, this should work. Uh, this is the book I wrote with my colleague, Ken Sharp, who teaches uh, in the political science department at Swarthmore. Uh, what prompted us to write the book and to teach a course on the topic, which we do almost every year, is the sense that we have that America is broken. And what I mean by that is that our schools are failing to educate our children, our clinics are failing to heal the sick, at least as well as it, they could be. The legal system increasingly offers justice for a fee. Drug companies are corrupting science. The financial system is in tatters. The political system is completely dysfunctional. The, uh, uh, the Supreme Court has become almost completely political. I think I've run down all the institutions there are. Wherever we look, uh, institutions are failing to give us what we want and what we need. Now, my uh, observation, it, it doesn't take enormous perceptiveness to come to these conclusions. The evidence is just all around. So everyone knows that our institutions are in trouble. And the question then is, how do you fix them? And the answer that uh, people have come up with is basically to rely on two tools. Wherever you look, the same two tools. One, make more and better rules. The way to fix the financial system is to regulate the hell out of it, or more accurately, re-regulate the hell out of it. Um, the second tool, in addition to or instead of uh, rules, is more and smarter incentives. Make it worth people's while to do the right thing, and they'll do the right thing. Make it so that people do well by doing good, and they will do good. There's got to be a magic incentive that will get teachers to teach well and bankers to behave responsibly instead of irresponsibly. Rules and incentives, sticks and carrots, what else is there? And if you look at the efforts particularly to solve the financial crisis, you'll see that the, this exhausted the uh, tools, the, the uh, weapons, that people trying to fix the financial system thought they had at their disposal. I think, and Ken thinks, that this is a profoundly mistaken, that rules, no matter how stringent, and incentives, no matter how clever, will never get us what we want and what we need. There's an additional thing that we need that you virtually never see discussed, and that additional thing is character, or to use an old-fashioned word, virtue. What we need is people who do the right thing because it's the right thing. And we need a particular virtue that the philosopher Aristotle called practical wisdom. And so what I'm going to do in this talk, I hope, is this. I'm going to uh, first try to give you some um, examples of why we need practical wisdom in our work and in our private lives. Then I'll spend a little bit of time telling you what I think practical wisdom is. Then I'll talk about how in our efforts to make things better, we are actually making them worse because we are threatening practical wisdom. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we can maybe respond to these threats 
as individuals and as institutions by nurturing wisdom and by allowing it to be deployed by practitioners. And last, if there's time, but it should be two or three when I get to this, I'll talk about how wise practitioners can be not only be better practitioners, but also be happier and more satisfied practitioners. So that's the plan. Okay? Let's start with some examples. Whoop. Let's start with some examples. There we go. So I'm going to give you two examples, one of a judge and one of uh, hospital janitors. Judge Lois Forer was a, a judge in Philadelphia criminal court for many years, and she wrote an article about the case of Michael. Michael was a typical offender, young, black, male, high school dropout without a job. The charge was a relatively insignificant holdup that occasioned no comment in the newspapers, even though this is what newspapers are for, is to tell you about fires and car accidents and crime, as near as I can tell. The trial itself in the busy life of a judge was a completely run-of-the-mill event. The year before, Michael had held up a taxi and stolen $50 from the driver and the passenger, harming neither, although he had a gun. It was his first offense. Although he had dropped out of high school to marry his pregnant girlfriend, he later obtained a high school equivalency diploma. He had been steadily employed, earning enough to send his daughter to parochial school, which was a considerable sacrifice for him and his wife. Shortly before the holdup, he had lost his job. Despondent because he didn't know how he was going to be able to support his family, he went out on a Saturday night, had a little bit too much to drink, and then he robbed the taxi. There was no dispute about the facts of the case. And this is how Forer describes her thinking. There was no doubt that Michael was guilty, but the penalty posed problems. The prosecutor wanted a five-year sentence. Uh, when I turned to Pennsylvania sentencing guidelines, which was a state statute designed to give similar sentences to offenders who commit similar crimes, the minimum, sentence, the minimum sentence prescribed by the guidelines was 24 months. I decided to deviate from the guidelines. I sentenced Michael to 11 and a half months in county jail and permitted him to work outside prison during the day to support his family. So he would sleep in jail, get up, go to work, come back, back to jail, and he did that for 11 and a half months. My rationale for the lesser penalty, which I outlined in a lengthy opinion, was that this was a first offense, nobody was hurt, he was acting under pressure of unemployment and need, and he seemed truly contrite. He had never committed a violent act, and he posed no danger to the public. A sentence of close to a year seemed adequate to convince him of the seriousness of his crime. I should point out that the gun Michael was using in this crime was a toy. So Michael served out his 11 and a half months, was released from working all the while, was released from jail, kept his job, and reunited successfully with his family. So here is a case of a judge using judgment. How odd for a judge to use judgment, deviating from the rules, and dispensing a sentence that seemed appropriate to the circumstances. We will return to Judge Forer and Michael a little bit later. This seems like a story with a happy ending. It is a story with a happy ending if only this were the ending. Let's turn to janitors. This is work done by my friend and colleague Amy Rosniewski and various collaborators. She studied hospital custodians, hospital janitors at a major teaching hospital in the Midwest. This is the job description of the janitors who worked in this hospital. There's going to be a test. I want you to memorize all of these items. There's a long list of duties, none of them at all surprising. There's more. So this is what the hospital, this is what hospital custodians are supposed to do. If you actually look at the, this list, 
as I say, none of it is the least bit surprising, none of it is the least bit complicated, and none of it, not a single item on the list, mentions another human being. These people could just as well be working in a mortuary as in a hospital. And some of the janitors who worked there did their jobs, but other janitors, who Amy and her uh, collaborators found, were doing a different job. There was Mike, who described to Amy how one day he was mopping the floors in the hallway, and Mr. Jones, uh, recently uh, recovering, recovering from recent surgery, got out of his bed and started walking up and down the hall because the doctor told him he needed to get some exercise. And so Mike stopped washing the floor. And Charlene, who had to clean the visitor's lounge, didn't, because there were a bunch of uh, family members there who were keeping a vigil over a seriously ill um, relative, and they were taking a nap. So she decided to let them rest in peace uh, uh, instead of doing uh, what was she was supposed to do, uh, which was to clean the lounge. And then there was Luke, who described how uh, the, uh, the father of a patient who'd been in a coma in the hospital for a couple of months had, a, had confronted him angrily for not cleaning the son's room. The dad had gone out to smoke a cigarette, and he came back, and he thought the room wasn't cleaned, and Luke said, you know, I did clean the room, but I could see how angry he was, and I could see how he needed to feel like he was doing something to help his son, so I cleaned it again. I apologized and I cleaned it again. And the interviewer said, what, so you cleaned it a second time? And Luke said, yeah, I could see how his father could be feeling. So I cleaned it again. There's another custodian who took it upon herself to remove pictures from the walls in hospital rooms and substitute other pictures so people who were subjected to long hospital stays could feel like there was some change in the scenery and some sense that progress was being made. And then another, another uh, uh, custodian described how she had developed a nice relationship with a patient who was really, really freaked out at the prospect of having blood drawn, and they needed to take blood, and he was resisting and, you know, flailing around, and she came into the room and calmed him down and explained patiently why the nurses needed to draw the blood, and he got calm, and they were able to draw the blood. None of these activities each of which involves interacting with human beings. None of these activities were part of the job description of the hospital custodians. Not only did they improve the lives of the patients and uh, the patients' families, but they also were almost certainly essential to the smooth and efficient running of the hospital. If people who worked in hospitals simply did their jobs, hospitals would stop working. They don't do their jobs as defined. They do their jobs as necessary given the mission of the hospital. They behave wisely. And when you interview these people and you ask them how hard is it to learn how to be a hospital janitor, people who, who do the work in this way say, well, it takes a lot of experience. You gotta know how to relate to people, how to, listen, how to hear what they're saying, uh, how to take initiative but not overstep your bounds and start getting involved in stuff that really requires uh, technical expertise. It takes a lot of training and experience to learn how to be a hospital janitor if you think that being a hospital janitor involves more than washing floors and emptying trash cans. So we have here two examples, a judge and a janitor, both of them essentially ignoring their job description, the judge ignoring the sentencing guidelines of the state of, of Pennsylvania, and the, um, and the janitors ignoring what are the duties of their, of their job, uh, and doing what's needed, doing the right thing because it's the right thing. And the question is, how is it that people, what does it take to be able to do these things? I'm losing a critical page. Give me a mistake. Give me a second, here we are. Not all janitors are like this, it goes without saying, but the ones who are, are, as I say, essential to the 
effective functioning of hospitals. What Judge Forer and the janitors had in common is they had the will, the moral will, to do right by other people. Beyond that, they had the skill to figure out what doing right meant, what doing right required in each particular situation they faced. Moral will, moral skill. Together they comprise what Aristotle called practical wisdom. He wouldn't have divided it up in this way. I mean, he's probably turning over in his grave that I did. But so the motivation to do the right thing, that's what the will is about, and the know-how to figure out what the right thing is in each particular situation. And uh, in case you think that the, what the janitors were doing doesn't involve a moral dimension, uh, let me suggest that at least from my point of view, pretty much any interaction we have with other people has a moral dimension. So unless you live and work in complete isolation, everything you do requires a certain moral sensibility. This was true of the judge, it's true of the janitors, and as we'll see a little bit later, it's true of teachers, it's true of doctors, it's true of anyone who works with other people. So this is what wisdom is. Okay. So they both deviated from rules, and they both appreciated that rules can only take you so far. Many of the most common of our everyday moral decisions can't be decided by rules, even if the rules are good. Let me give you a few examples. Let me propose a rule, a moral rule. Be honest, tell the truth. Is that a good rule? Anyone think that's a bad rule? You think it's a bad rule? <laughs> Sometimes. Well, I think it's a pretty damn good rule. I don't think you can get rules that are much better than that one. But consider, your friend calls you up. She's getting dressed to go to a wedding. Not her wedding, but a wedding. So she wants you to come over and tell her how you think she looks. So you dutifully come over. She opens the door, and she does a little. How do I look? And actually what you think is not so good. And the question is, what do you say? Tell the truth. Yes, good rule. Is that what you say? You don't? I think this turns out, this simple situation turns out to be remarkably complex. I think the right answer to this question is, it depends. It depends on, does she have a plan B? It depends on, what kind of self-confidence does she have? Will she be shattered? She obviously thinks she looks great. Will she be shattered to find out that other people think she doesn't look great when she thinks she does? Will she ever trust her own judgment again when she looks in the mirror? You need to know your friend. Tell the truth is a good rule, but there's another good rule, which is be kind. And the question is, which of those two very good rules is the one that should be operating when you open your mouth and answer her question? So it takes judgment and an intimate knowledge of the particular person to know what the right thing to do is in this situation. And let me emphasize that not only do you have to exercise judgment, but you really have to do it fast. If she says, how do I look, and it takes you 10 minutes to answer the question while you're doing all this thinking, you, there's no point in you opening your mouth, right? So somehow you have to do this calculation. What does she need? What can she handle? What's the right thing for me to do for this person at this moment? And you have to do it fast. So it's a good rule, but it, unfortunately it's a rule that has exceptions. Real life example, a doctor named uh, Jerome Lowenstein was treating a 70-year-old man been treating him for over a decade. He had this persistent cough. Antibiotics were not helping. Um, 
Lowenstein ordered a CT scan and it revealed masses in the patient's lungs that turned out to be malignant. The guy was, was dying of lung cancer. Condition was not curable. Lowenstein explained all of this to the patient's wife and she immediately said, you can't tell him he has cancer. And Lowenstein found himself in an impossibly, um, uh, uh, impossibly difficult moral situation. Doctors are not supposed to lie to their patients. They're not supposed to withhold information from their patients. You, it's a disrespectful to lie or withhold information from patients. What should I do? He asked himself. So he consulted with other doctors. He consulted with the psychotherapist that this patient had seen on and off for um, depression. And then he did what all males do in situations of moral perplexity. He asked his wife. And after a great deal of hand-wringing, he honored uh, this patient's wife's request and she assured him that if he just told him he had a complicated cough that required further treatment, the husband would be compliant with whatever treatment the doctor ordered. And so that's what he did. The guy was compliant. He lived another 18 months, and he died peacefully, tranquilly, and contentedly without ever knowing that he had cancer. So here was a case where tell the truth, which I think in general is a very good principle for doctors to follow, um, isn't, wasn't the last word and perhaps shouldn't have been the last word. So, as I say, it's a good rule, but rules only take you so far. Here's another good rule. Respect the autonomy of individuals. Treat people as autonomous decision-making agents. Think that's a good rule? I think it's an excellent rule. So imagine that you're a lawyer. Anyone here intending to be a lawyer, even though there aren't any jobs for lawyers anymore? <laughs> so. There are two principles that govern, two ethical principles that govern um, the sense that lawyers have of what their responsibilities are to clients. One of them is to be a zealous advocate. Your client wants X, fight as hard as you can to get X. The other is to be a wise counselor. These two commitments that lawyers make are often in conflict. Your client wants to extract every ounce of pain and suffering possible from the person who is soon to be her ex-husband. That's what she wants. As a zealous advocate, that's what you try to achieve. Except that there are three kids and creating an, incredibly, an incredible atmosphere of acrimony surrounding the uh, dissolution of the marriage will almost certainly cause great suffering to the kids. Maybe. Uh, permanent damage to the kids. So are you going to be a, a zealous advocate in the interest of your client or are you going to try to convince your client that what she wants isn't what she should want? Are you going to be a wise counselor in this case or a zealous advocate in this case? I think lawyers find that they are frequently faced with a choice between two of the, their, the two objectives of their profession. And the same thing is true with doctors counseling patients and financial advisors counseling clients. Sales, I mean, this is hard to imagine. Even salespeople with customers. Can you imagine going into a store to buy a cell phone and being told by the salesperson in the store that the phone you want isn't the phone you should want. It's more powerful than what you need. You should actually get the cheaper one. Has anyone ever had this experience in a retail establishment? You have, it's amazing, because I assume these people get fired five minutes after they do this. So it's another good rule, treat people fairly. Yes, an excellent rule, but what does it mean to treat people fairly? Does it mean treat everybody the same? Do you think good teachers treat every student the same? I think it's pretty much self-evidently true that a teacher who treats every student the same is not a good teacher because teachers know that different kids need different things. So what it means to treat your students fairly is to give each student what he or she needs, which almost certainly means treating each student differently. 
As parents, we learn this very quickly when we're raising our children. The same thing is true when you are raising children in an elementary classroom. So rules and principles, we need them. They provide us with guidelines. They provide us with anchors. But they are almost never enough. And Aristotle appreciated this. Aristotle was very interested in the, in the uh, craft work of uh, ordinary laborers in ancient Greece. He would watch how they did their jobs with real fascination, thinking that there were no doubt important lessons to be learned from how they solved the day-to-day -day problems they faced. And he was especially uh, taken with the stonemasons who were building these wonderful structures, uh, the pieces of which still exist thousands of years later. And you know, they would measure stuff out using rulers, straight edges, but what he wondered is how do you measure out round columns? You got a column on the left side of the entry and a column on the right side of the entry. How do you make them so they're identical? You can't use a ruler. And the calculus hadn't been invented. How do you make them identical? And he discovered that the way they had solved this problem of measuring round things with rigid objects, like rulers, is to make unrigid objects. So they invented the lead rule, which has come down as the tape measure. So the solution that they found to the problem is that sometimes, pardon the joke, sometimes to do the right thing, you have to bend the rule. And Aristotle thought that this lesson from stonemasons is a lesson that applies to virtually every moral decision that we face in our interactions with other people. Rules are helpful, but sometimes, maybe often, you have to bend the rule. And the question is when and in what way. Rules are, if you like, a road map that gets us to the right city, but doesn't get us, but, but doesn't get us to the right street. So imagine Google Maps before it gets resolved into this molecular detail. So you know, I will never find this campus unless I have a map that gets me to Lancaster. But a map that gets me to Lancaster doesn't enable me to find this campus. So rules get you to Lancaster, but then something else is needed to get you to the F&M campus. That was Aristotle's sense. Rules get you in the right ballpark, but then wisdom and judgment is needed to get you to find the right street. And that's what wisdom does. So wisdom, uh, practical wisdom, has these attributes. Wise people know that no two patients, no two students, no two employees, no two clients are exactly alike and appreciates that rules and standard procedures have to be modified to allow for the diversity of human needs, the diversity of human circumstances, and the diversity of human aspirations. A wise person knows when and how to make the exception to every rule. A wise person knows how to improvise. Uh, Ken and I sometimes talk about wisdom as a kind of moral jazz. Jazz musicians can read the notes on the page. They know how to play the notes on the page, but that's not what makes them jazz musicians. What makes them jazz musicians is the way in which they dance around the notes on the page. You need notes on the page to get yourself started, but if that's all you do, whatever it is you are, you are not a jazz musician. Wise people know how to choose when virtues conflict, as in the case of your friend dressed for the wedding. Two virtues, be kind, be honest, in conflict. How do you resolve the conflict? Wise people know how to take the perspective of another. They know how to empathize. They know um, that it's important to see the situation as the other person does and to understand how the other person feels. It is this kind of perspective taking that enables wise people to feel empathy for others and make decisions that serve the needs of others. Now, probably a lot of us think that the golden rule is a great rule. It, if you lived your life according to the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, you'd be a pretty decent person. And I think that's true. You would be a pretty decent person. I also think it's not adequate. The trick is not to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's egocentric. 
The trick is to do unto others as they would have you do unto them. And in order to do that, you need to understand what it is that they want and need and not what you would want and need if you were in their situation. And as hard as it is to live up to the golden rule, it is ever so much harder to get enough perspective on the views of other people that you can really put yourself in their places and imagine what they need and not what you would need. Let's call that the platinum rule, right? The American Express platinum card is better than the, then there's the black card, which I think gets you like the keys to the world. I don't know what, what I have no moral rule that's equivalent to the black card. Um, wise people use these skills in pursuit of the right aims. They use these skills to serve the needs of other people. They could use these skills to exploit other people. The best salespeople have all these attributes, but their aim when they deploy these attributes is to take advantage of you, not to serve you. So this can be a terrible weapon in the hands of someone who doesn't have the right intentions. So the, you know, the intentions matter. Finally, a wise person is an experienced person. I know that most of you are students. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. You ain't wise. You just can't be wise yet. The way you become wise is by having experience, by trying, by failing, by getting feedback from your failures, by failures, by getting closer to the right thing the next time, but failing again, getting more feedback, and finally, over some period of time, really being in a position where you get it right most of the time. There is no way to put this experience into a bottle and just slug it down or into a course. I mean, we teach a course on wisdom, but it is certainly not intended to create wise students. It's intended to create students who appreciate the importance of wisdom and will then take every opportunity to develop it in themselves as they, as they uh, continue to live. Uh, will Rogers once said that there are some people who have had 30 years of experience and then there are people who have had the same experience for 30 years. If you've had the same experience for 30 years, you are probably exactly as wise after 30 years as you were when you started. You need to be able to take initiative, to vary what you do, to be attentive to the consequences of what you do, and slowly over time to hone your sense of what the situation calls for and get wiser and wiser. So this is what I think wisdom is. You need time to get to know the people you are serving. You need permission to be allowed to improvise. If those hospital janitors had a supervisor following around behind them, you know, uh, insisting that they adhere to their job description, none of them would have been able to do any of the things that I described. They'd have been chastised for even trying. You need permission to improvise, to try, occasionally to fail, and to learn from your failures. You need to be mentored by wise teachers. Uh, and when you ask the janitors, as I said, who behave in the way the ones I described behave, how hard it is to learn to do the, their jobs, they tell you that it takes a lot of experience to learn to do the jobs well. It doesn't take a lot of experience to empty trash cans and mop floors. It takes a lot of experience to interact in a way that is helpful, with the patients, the patient's families, the doctors, the nurses, and the other staff. It takes a lot of experience to learn how to care for people. Now, I think all of this is completely obvious. I don't think that anything I've said should, be, should light a light bulb in your heads that hasn't already been lit. And yet, when we try to repair broken institutions, we don't ask what can we do about the character of people who work in those institutions? We don't ask. We ask instead, how can we make better rules or how can we create smarter incentives? So it may be obvious, but in the hands of people who make the rules and set policies, they sure as hell don't act like it's obvious. In fact, what I will suggest to you now is that every effort to make institutions work better by designing more rules or smarter incentives actually moves practitioners further away from wisdom and not closer to it. So what we are doing, uh, inadvertently and unintentionally, is we're, we're actually engaged in a war on wisdom.
when you make rules, you are making war on the development of moral skill. If people can't improvise because they have to follow the rules, then they're like people who've been doing the same job for 30 years. And there are plenty, alas, plenty of examples of this. I'll just give you a few. This is my favorite example. This is a true story. All these stories I'm telling you are true stories. Um, it should go without saying. This is the lemonade example. And uh, a dad who's a professor at the University of Michigan took his seven-year-old son to a Detroit Tiger baseball game. A few innings into the game, his son asked him for some lemonade. So dad got up and went to the concession stand to buy a bottle of lemonade. All they had was a product called Mike's Hard Lemonade, which is 5% alcohol. Since the dad was an academic, and academics are notorious for not having any clue what's going on in the real world, he bought it, and he brought it down to the son, and his son started drinking this alcoholic beverage. Luckily, a campus security person spotted it, immediately called the police and uh, an ambulance, which rushed to the stadium, rushed up to the seats, and whisked the child to the ER to make sure that he had not somehow poisoned himself with three sips of 5% alcohol lemonade. So they did a workup on the kid. The kid was fine, and the docs were all set to let them go. Not so fast, said the cops. You can't leave. And they took the child, and they put the child in, temporarily in a foster home to protect the child from abuse and neglect. And they said, we hate to do it, but we have to follow procedure. A few days later, the dad came before the magistrate, and the magistrate said, we will let the child go back home, but only if you, dad, leave the house and check into a hotel. I hate to do it, said the magistrate, but we have to follow procedure. After two weeks, the dad was allowed to rejoin his family. So this, uh, this ended up having a happy ending. And when I heard this story on uh, mor weekend morning edition, Scott Simon, who, uh, who told the story, said, procedures may be dumb and this surely counts as a dumb procedure, but they spare you from thinking. And to be fair, here's the important part, procedures are often imposed because previous officials have been lax and let a child go back to an abusive household. In Philadelphia, approximately once a year, there's a front page story of a kid unbelievably horribly abused in the home the family is on the map with the social welfare agency. They know about this, and somehow they allow this, they allow this abuse to continue. And so what happens when you see this? You make some rules so that this particular failure of the social welfare process won't occur again. And the reason, no doubt, that they had these rules in place with regard to this kid and his consumption of Mike's Hard Lemonade is that they too in Detroit had experienced cases where somehow abused kids had fallen through the safety net. So every time that happens, you add one more rule and one more rule and one more rule, and the result is that you take all the discretion out of the hands of people who work in the system. So this is an example of how you can virtually guarantee that people working in a system won't be wise because they never have to use their judgment and discretion. They just have to follow the rules. Judge Forer, I said I would get back to her. So Michael serves his sentence, he's out, family is intact, a happy ending, except that the prosecutor was really pissed off. The prosecutor was pissed off that he'd gotten such a light sentence, so he appealed the sentence and the wheels of justice grind exceedingly slow in Pennsylvania, and eventually the appeals court ruled, and the appeals court ruled in favor of the prosecutor, and Michael was required to go back to prison for another four years and two weeks. He had already finished his term. What happened? Two things happened. One, Michael disappeared 
never to be seen again, successfully breaking up the family, and two, Judge Four quit. She resigned as a judge. She realized being a judge no longer allows you to exercise judgment. This is not a job I want. And I think the lesson here is that when you have too many rules, you either drive wise judgment out of people or you drive wise people out of the practice because they can't exercise their wise judgment. One last example is uh, uh, education. Uh, here too, a true story, Christine Jabari, day 53, teaching kindergarten in Chicago. Uh, she opens a thick binder uh, to day 53. 20,000 other Chicago's teachers have identical binders, crammed with goals, conversation starters, and step-by-step -step questions. And here's what Ms. Jabari sees. Script for day 53, title, reading and enjoying literature, words with B, text, the bath, lecture, assemble students on the rug or reading area, give students a warning about the dangers of hot water, say, listen very quietly as I read the story, say, think of other pictures that make the same sound as the sound bath begins with. There is a 75-item list of instructions for teaching a 25-page picture book to kindergarten teachers. And everyone who is teaching kindergarten on that day in the city of Chicago is following exactly the same script. Now, let me ask you, what kind of people will continue to do jobs that have that structure? Are the kinds of teachers who find this an acceptable work environment the kinds of people we want being teachers? Of course not. You drive good teachers out or you drive the good out of teachers. One or the other of these things is bound to happen. Rules are put in place to prevent mistakes and rightly so. Some kinds of mistakes simply have to be prevented. It's a very good idea to have a set of rules or a checklist to make sure that everyone who enters the operating room is sterile. There is no excuse for patients getting infections from the doctors and the nursing staff. And it's hard for me to think of a single exception to wash your damn hands. But most situations aren't like that. Uh, the price you pay for too many rules is that they deprive people of the opportunity to learn from a mistake, and that in turn undermines their ability to improvise and to find solutions for problems that rules cover either imperfectly or not at all. And the appeal to rules is a war against mistakes, against discretion, against judgment, and it is self-reinforcing. The more rules are dominate a particular domain of activity, the more moral skill you take out of the practices in that activity, the more rules you need. The more rules you make, the more rules you need. So that's what rules do. Well, if I've convinced you that rules are a bad idea, how about incentives? Let's try that. Reward people for doing the right thing, and they'll do the right thing more. Well. Even good incentives fail. And unlike rules, which undermine the development of moral skill, incentives undermine the development of moral will. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Daycare center in Israel. Parents are coming late to pick up their kids. Not egregiously late, just a little bit late, just annoyingly late, just late enough that it screws up their teacher's plans for the evening. So you tell them, listen, come on time, and they still come late. So the director of the daycare center, having studied economics, came up with a brilliant idea. We'll fine parents if they come late. If you come late to pick up your kids, you'll pay the equivalent of a parking ticket. Surely now, parents already have one good reason to come on time. It's their responsibility. You're giving them a second reason it will cost you to come late. So what happens when you incentivize coming on time in this way? What do you think happens to lateness? It 
goes up. Goes up about 70%. Now, the fine is meant to be a fine, a punishment for a transgression. But the parents don't think of it as a fine. Instead, they think of it as a price. And it's a price that they are more than willing to pay. What? 30 bucks, I get to spend an extra half hour in the office? Good deal. So the fines continue. Uh, the lateness continues to go up. And after several months of this, the director just waves his hand in complete disbelief and abandons the uh, fines. Now what do you think happens to lateness? Goes back to the, where it was before? It goes up even more. At the end of this procedure, lateness is twice as likely as it was at the start of this procedure. Why? Because in introducing the fines, what has effectively been done is that the, act, the, the sense that you're supposed to come on time has been demoralized. That is to say, the moral dimensions of it have been eliminated. And now the only thing you've got going for you is the fine. And when the fines are removed, there's no reason for anyone to come on time. And this, as a general matter, is what incentives seem to do. They may work, but the price you pay is that the moral hold on people, the moral motives to do the right thing are systematically undermined. And there is no system of fines or of rewards that's an adequate substitute for people who are doing the right thing because it's their responsibility to do the right thing. Um, we see this dramatically in the effort to hold educational systems accountable for the progress that students make. This is the big test culture of modern America pretty much permeates everything. We're going to make you be a good teacher and we're going to measure how good a teacher you are by giving these big tests in fifth grade and eighth grade. And if your kids don't cut the mustard, out you go. Or even worse, out your school goes, or out your principal goes. Highly consequential big tests. Now, we all know what happens when you introduce this. Test scores go up, which I guess is a sign of the triumph of a system that incentivizes good test performance, right? I see people shaking their heads. Why? Isn't it good that test scores have gone up 10%? No, why not? Because how is it that test scores go up 10%? Teachers teach to the test. Stunning. You're going to pay me based on how well my kids do on these tests. I'm going to make damn sure that my kids do well on these tests. So the tests stop being measures of how much kids learn because teachers have figured out how to teach their students to do well on the tests and they're no longer interested in whether their students are learning because there's no incentive on student learning. The incentive is just on student test performance. They may come in deeply committed to educating and exciting kids about the prospect of learning, they quickly become people whose job is to produce high test scores. And as, I'm, as I suspect you may know, if teaching to the test doesn't work, there is another strategy that people follow. They've done it in Pennsylvania, they've done it in Georgia, they've done it in New York, and I suspect they've done it in every state. It just hasn't, they haven't been caught yet, and that is teachers simply cheat. They sneak into the office at night, unlock the file cabinet, and they change student answers on tests. So one really good way to get high test performance is for the teacher basically to take the test instead of the students, and that's what this brilliant incentive system has done. And I think exactly the same thing has happened in the financial sector. I think this helps explain why, it's not the whole explanation, but it helps explain why the financial collapse was so dramatic and in some ways inevitable. In, 19, in the early 1990s, less than 10% of executive compensation in publicly held companies was contingent on the price of shares. Less than 10% of the CEO's salary was contingent on share price. You with me? In 2003, almost 70% of CEO compensation was contingent on share price. 
Well, if you're the CEO and 70% of what you make depends on what the price is of your company's shares, what attitude are you going to have when it comes to making strategic decisions about the company? Your interest is going to be on how the company does in the next quarter, not on how the company does in the next decade. So the idea in doing this was to make it so that the CEO would care about the success of the company because every ounce of company success was going to be translated into an ounce of executive compensation. The better the company does, the better I do. Questions? Ah, okay. All right, I, I will, uh, God, I get carried away, sorry. So let me at least, having given you all this bad news, whoop, that was a little too excessive. You don't need this. What can we do to fix this problem? There are a few things. We need to appreciate the importance of wisdom and to defend it in words and in argument. We need to encourage it. Uh, and most Conversations that occur in workplaces, and certainly most conversations that occur in academic institutions, the word wisdom is never mentioned. The second thing we need to do is figure out ways to actually nurturing it among the people we supervise. By giving people discretion, by letting them uh, take chances, by allowing them to improvise and maybe make mistakes. Managers have to be willing to give up some control in return for which they will end up with a more committed and uh, no doubt more successful workforce. We need to remind people of the reason they do the work they do. That there is a noble mission associated or that one could associate with most of the work people do and it's just completely disregarded or ignored when you are learning the ropes in a new job. And I'll just give you one example and then I'll finish. Uh, at, at the University of Pennsylvania, in most places, they have undergraduates calling alums to try to get them to make contributions. This is a wonderful job to have. Nowadays, with caller ID, you, they don't even pick up the phone. In the old days, they would pick up the phone and just slam it down when you were half, halfway through your spiel. So, you know, you may call after call after call after call, and nobody says, yes, I'll, make, I'll, write, a, I'll write a check. How do you make this better? Well, a guy named Adam Grant at Penn figured out a way. He showed the people doing this, this calling a 15-minute videotape of a student, a recent Penn graduate, who had gotten a scholarship thanks to the, solicitation, the phone solicitations of alums for contributions. This scholarship had completely changed this student's life and life trajectory, and the student was incredibly grateful, and this 15-minute video was a, a, a testimonial for the incredible importance of the work these students were doing. That's it. What happens? The rate of phone calls in the, when the students are doing this job almost doubled, and the rate of contributions went up by more than 100%, just by taking the trouble to remind people who are making these calls that there is a noble purpose behind it, is enough to change their attitude and their commitment to doing the job as well as they possibly can. And the benefit of this, aside from getting better work and having institutions run better, is that people who work in this way will be happier. They will be happier because their relations with coworkers and clients and customers will be better. They will have a richer and more satisfying social life as a result. The work they do will be more meaningful and more engaging because they will see the evidence on a case-by-case -case basis that their interventions are making a difference. We know from a lot of research that, that the two most important determinants of happiness are good work and good relations with other people. I think you can't do good work unless you're wise. You can't have good relations with other people unless you're wise. So the wiser we become, the better our work will be, the better our relations with friends and families will be, the happier we'll be. So go out, everybody, and take every opportunity to be wise. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry I took so long. We might have time for one quick question. I'm watching the time, it's 12.32. We have three minutes. I thought I had till 12.45. Did I misread the schedule? 
Anyway, I like to avoid in time for questions. <laughs> I'm no fool. Hi, I'm Susan Manasian, the college chaplain. Um, in the 26 years of ordained ministry that I've been in, I have experienced working with people on a variety, on the continuum of ages. And what I've experienced is that age and lifespan is not a measurement of wisdom. And so in my experience here in particular, there are some students that I would say have more wisdom than some people who may be twice, three or four times their age. If we say to young people, you have no wisdom, where's the incentive in having them even want to cultivate that? And why not start with saying, how do we affirm the wisdom we recognize when they actually demonstrate that? That's a great point. Let me, I think there is a positive relation between age and wisdom, although it's by no means perfect. You're absolutely right. There are young people who are wise, and God knows there are people who have been around a long time who are about as wise as, as fence posts. So I completely agree with you about that. And I was too glib when I said young people aren't wise. When we teach our class, we begin the class by talking about the one domain in which our students have had a lot of experience and arguably are wiser than they know, and that is the domain of friendship. Everybody, at, by the time you're 18, everyone's an expert on what it takes to be a good friend. And so we explore how hard it is to be a good friend and how all of the skills we're talking about are displayed when good friends interact with one another and meet each other's needs. And indeed, I think that does empower them to take the possibility seriously that that's what they should be cultivating when they become doctors and lawyers and teachers. So I think Thank you're you. absolutely right about that. Thank you.